developing Game Boy stuff for fun and almost certainly no profit. Why? Because sometimes I think we don't have enough completely frivolous technology talks here. And so when I eventually get around to it, it's usually something that might, will hopefully interest some people and will probably be of use to no people. Um, codes and slides are available at that URL and that uh, QR code. And so the first question is, why the Game Boy? Originally, I'd been thinking maybe a <coughs> doing a talk on Game Boy Advanced or maybe Genesis. I've kind of been thinking about it for like, I don't know, a couple years now. But then earlier this year, McDonald's commissioned a new Game Boy Color game for 2023, Grimace's birthday. They put it in a web page, in a Game Boy emulator running in a web page, and you can also download the ROM, and if you have a flash cartridge, you can put it on real Game Boy hardware. I went and bought a flash cartridge for tonight, and then completely forgot to bring my Game Boy with me, <laughs> or the flash cartridge, so that doesn't help. Um, so that's why Game Boy. Also, I was thinking that I would do a Game Boy Color, because they did, and it, but I cut that back for time. Um, what is the Game Boy? Handheld from 1989, I guess a picture would have made sense here, but I didn't bring one. It has a Z80 kind of-ish CPU that would be known from such hits as the MSX platform, if you follow Japanese home computers at all, the Sega Master System, the lesser known thing that came before, the Sega Genesis, um, and w as well as all of those CPM machines that were more for business than home use, so I don't know how many people would have had a chance to have ever touched a CPM machine, but it used to be big before DOS took off. In fact, DOS was originally because <laughs> IBM couldn't reach a licensing deal with the CPM people for the PC. Uh, so the Z80 in the Game Boy, uh, it has eight kilobytes of RAM, relatively a lot for machines with Z80s that were aimed at video game use. Uh, that's four times the amount of RAM in the um, Nintendo Entertainment System. 32K of ROM, that's rather oversimplified, we'll vaguely touch on that later. 160 by 144 pixel greenish grayish screen and some amount of facilities for making noise to a speaker. Tools not used. Game Boy Studio. Somebody has made a really fancy IDE with drawing tools, animation tools, music tools, putting it all together tools aimed at the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Uh, my understanding is this is what was used to write Grimace's birthday. I did not use it because it is a no-code solution and I wasn't really that interested in it. The other thing I did not use, assembly. This is what was traditionally used by most people who were writing Game Boy and Game Boy Color games back in the day. Uh, these days, there's really good C compiler support for the Z80. The Z80 seems to fit C a little bit better than some of its other contemporary CPUs like the ever-famous 6502 from the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Commodore 64 fame, not to mention the Atari 2600. But, you know, people didn't use it back then. So what I did use, the Game Boy Development Kit 2020 redo. It uses the LCC C compiler for Z80. I used the BGP emulator. I used the GBTD tile editor. We'll be going more into that later. And the GBMB tile map editor. Those last three programs are Windows only. They, the last two of them are apparently written in horrifically outdated versions of the Delphi programming language. And they all just work trademark in wine. So <laughs> I guess not really win the 32 after, only after all. Frankly, I'm starting to think that for people developing software commercially for Linux that want to distribute it commercially, wine actually might be a really good way to go. Uh, you know, because it's, if you target wine, then you don't have to worry about well, what about the weirdness between Fedora or Ubuntu versus Arch? Uh, it's really insane, but um, it almost makes sense. 
And of course, that's what people are switching to for games these days increasingly. Like if you look on Steam and a game is available for Windows with labeled Linux Proton support and Linux, you'll find that the Windows version works better on Linux than the Linux version is. Sometimes you'll find that the Windows version works better on Linux than it does on Windows. Um, run how? If you write software for it, you can run it in an emulator locally. You can run it in an emulator in a web browser. You can run it on real hardware. You can make EEPROM carts, which would probably be the closest to ma making a new original cart uh, without the multi-million dollar cost of having custom ROM chips make. You can run it on flash carts. You can run it on SRAM carts. Um, I did go and buy a flash cart for this. I, what I will eventually show you was r running on real hardware. I forgot to bring the real hardware with me, as I already mentioned. Um, I, so um, what w will I be doing? Pong for two players. Uh, the paddles will be controlling the world hello and the world Pong. I mean, the, the and the world word world, so I call it Hello World Pong because of that. Uh, and it's nice and awkward to have two people trying to share one Game Boy. <laughs> um, I did briefly try it with one person, but most of the time it turns out one player can play two player Pong by themselves. <laughs> it just is kind of weird. <laughs> um, so getting started, the Hello World program. Turns out Hello World is really complicated. Not just a one line print Hello World and you're done. So we started with the nothing program. Uh, and that, running on the emulator, produces nothing. What a surprise. The make file for it is nice and short. Uh, for the rest of it, I used a slightly more complicated make file because then I could get away with changing only this line between steps instead of having to keep editing the, the whole file for it. Um, so moving on to actually saying hello world. Well, you don't, can't just print text. There's no text engine built in. Um, you can't just write pixels because it's not meant for you to draw to a frame buffer like you would on you know, a PC if you've ever done like old DOS stuff. Instead, everything has to be done with tiles. Uh, tiles, the tile data is the same either way, but in their usage takes the forms of either usage as tiles or usage as sprites. Creating them, I used the Game Boy Tile Designer, which is a very simple uh, drawing program. You put all of your sprites in one file, so that's what the list is. So there's a tile for H, tile for E, tile for L, uh, O, W, R, D. Um, and that program, in turn, exports a C, uh, Header and C header and source code file with the data embedded in it. So then to use it, well, again, there's no text engine. So you know, we include that data, we tell it that all the data in that big array of gibberishly looking hex is tile data, and then we go through and say, okay, sprite number one uses I'm sorry, sprite number zero uses tile one. Sprite number one uses tile two. Sprite number two uses tile three. Sprite number three uses tile three again because while a tile can appear multiple places, a sprite can only appear once. Thus, uh, we're using it. And then, after we tell it that we have sprites, we have to tell it um, that to position the sprites. And uh, let's see if. Scrolling here works. Where did my point? There we go. No. Um, and so then, so we, you know, then we say, okay, now here are all the sprites for the world. Here's where we position all of them. Show sprites, and we're done. Not terribly complicated, but certainly a lot more than you would expect from Hello World. Uh, so. Running on the emulator, it produces Hello World, as expected. Um, the screen resolution, as we said earlier, is 160 by 144 pixels. The origin is the top left. That means that you have room for 
20 by 18 tiles. Uh, but in terms of the coordinate system, the coordinate system for it is 176 by 176. So there's 16 tiles off the top that you can't see. I'm not tiles, 16 rows of pixels off the top that you can't see, 16 rows of pixels off the bottom that you can't see, eight pixels you can't see to the left, eight pixels to the right. Um, so you wouldn't, so if you go and put a sprite at zero, zero, it is hidden. You have to start it at eight comma 16. Uh, let's see, next one. So movement, well, we had to move the sprite in the first place to put it in its position. So continued movement to have the hello worlds move around is just pass the same sprite number in to the move sprite function again with different coordinates. And you do that every frame loop, which is you know, every iteration of that while loop that I showed earlier. Um, so uh, next I'm going to move on to some basics on sound, which is both gonna be overly complicated perhaps, but also not really cover much. Registers. Um, while the Game Boy development kit includes functions for the sprites, they make you go straight to the hardware for anything with sound. <coughs> so, sorry, I should have prefaced this. I generally expect, except for the next few slides that are, which is why I'm going to be covering this, that anybody who knows JavaScript or anything could probably mostly follow the C code here. If for any reason I'm wrong about that, please raise your hand. So registers. You will start with pointers. You have an integer, it's five, whatever, fine. You have a pointer to that that you set to the ampersand means take the address of the variable rather than the value of the variable. And then you print it without dereferencing. That means you're printing the address that Y is stored, not the data that is Y is supposed to be pointed to. So it displays something like Y OX dead. In fact, you can skip the ampersand x and just put in a integer value there. If you try this on a Linux system, it's probably going to crash and burn because good it, it, uh, addresses, well, A, you probably won't guess an appropriate one, and if you did, what's appropriate changes every single time you run the program for security reasons. But on a really simple system like the Game Boy Advance, you can go and put absolute memory addresses into pointers just like this. Um, I don't know why I put the line, how do you know this is legal on there? So registers beyond that. Memory is a array of uh, OXF0000 to OXFFFF. Assembly people, for some reason, don't use the OXs and just use dollar signs, and almost all documentation is written for assembly people, so we'll mostly be switching to that after this. Um, so we go back to the memory is an array. Uh, well, I mean, you know, from the CPU's perspective, memory is an array, but what it thinks is that that array isn't necessarily all memory or even all there. Of course, we know that a lot on the PC because memory looks like an array of something like 16 exabytes, and clearly you don't have 16 exabytes of RAM in your system. Um, so on the Game Boy, half of that space is the cartridge from 0000 to 7FFFF. Then the space from C000 to DFFF is your actual memory. So dead is a valid memory address in there for memory. Uh, so what about this parts that aren't the ROM or the memory? Well, you can have hardware that watches the memory bus and that's how you communicate with the hardware. This is how you communicate with you know, anything on modern computers. The older computers sometimes had alternate ways of doing I.O., but anything vaguely modern for more than 30 years, you know, special memory addresses that happen to be non-memory hardware watching it is how you communicate with the hardware. So behind those move sprite or set tile data and all those functions 
it's going through and posting at memory addresses that are really talking to the graphics hardware of it. They abstract that away. And so I said, they don't do that for the sound. So uh, I guess I went through that before I hit that slide. Sound. Um, the Game Boy uses this memory range for controlling the sound hardware. The standard is to map them to variables with names like this. I don't know why. There's some historical reason. Um, and at least the Game Boy development kit does create those names that you would have seen in old documentation pointed to the right actual addresses for them. And their sound system is fairly complicated and I didn't feel like trying to really understand it for the purposes of this talk. Um, part of the point here is how little you can understand things and still write a program for them. So I copied some data from screwing around with program. These three values set up some sort of necessary initialization. I don't know what they're doing. It works. I don't really care that much. <laughs> Making sounds. I do know at least that these five values are for controlling the first sound channel. It has two square wave channels, a waveform channel, and a noise channel. What they don't mean, I don't know exactly, but this one and part, but not all of this value, are setting the frequency for the noise you want to generate. So I picked a noise in a demo program that showed you what it was doing with the registers as you dialed the values up and down. Started with that, and then the different noises I wanted, I just changed those to, so it's the same no noise, just at different frequencies for it. Um, and then that's what I went with. I don't know what the rest of it's relating to. Um, Presumably, they left out convenience functions for this because they were assuming that you would use some sort of library for it written elsewhere, because I know there are you know, really fancy music libraries for the Game Boy. Um, so that was the sound. Um, game control, there's eight buttons, up, down, left, right, start, select, A and B. There's eight bits in a byte. Oh, that's awfully convenient. So you read the joypad, and each bit <coughs> represents a different button. You mask it against a provided constant. You don't even need to know which bit is which button. And so um, I, uh, so that's how you get controls from it. So then moving on to tile maps. The tiles, you're limited to an absolute maximum of, sorry, for tiles used as sprites, you're limited to a maximum of 40 on the screen at once and 10 on a line at once. Since the line is 20 tiles wide, and if you have a game with backgrounds, then clearly they must not be using sprites for them. So for that, you have tile maps. A tile map is made of a map saying which tile goes where in a fairly static display. So you have a whole separate program, Game Boy Map Builder, for generating that. You import your tile data from the first program, and then you go saying, for instance, that cell 06 uses tile 19, you know, cell 07 uses tile 20, and so on, and if most of these are set still to tile 0, which is up above. You know, everything must be set to some value, but, I mean, obviously it comes in defaulting with everything to 0, and it's fairly common, I think, I guess I shouldn't make promises about that, but to, for tile zero to be left ze blank for these reasons. Unless you're certain you'll never want a blank thing anywhere in the program. So like the other program, this one exports its own header and C file. So we import the header file. We say that the background data is coming from uh, the same big array of tile, raw tile data that we used for the sprites. So uh, we're telling it how many tiles we actually are using, how many tiles that should be in that big array of tile data. So this is the same three values that I originally used for setting the sprite data. And then we tell it where, what array to use for the um, actual map as well as the dimensions of the map, where it should be on the screen. So 
This is the array exported by, of big, you know, not particularly sensible looking hex data exported by the second program. Well, technically it's the pointer to that array. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more you can do with backgrounds, but, you know, not relevant to this for now. So, it was doing all the tile data was, you know, a bunch of monkey around with those programs and then just two more lines of code. Collision, not actually a Game Boy specific thing and it turned out to be that my implementation was buggy. All you're trying to do is figure out are two boxes intersecting, that's all there is to it. I will show it later but I'm not gonna really go into it now. I'm just inserting it here because this was like sec step six of my progress. Uh, then going on to start functionality. This wasn't one I'd planned on originally but um, you, uh, Game Boy Development Kit, ha there's no random stuff for the most part on the Game Boy. There's no like random way to get random numbers from the hardware for, for the most part. Um, so you need a pseudo random number generator. You generally want to be getting in more creative applications that aren't security related, getting your numbers from a random number generator anyway because that helps with debugability. You start with the same speed, you get the same sequence of numbers every time. On the Game Boy, uh, but then, you know, on the idea would be on startup, you want to give it a different speed seed every time so that your game doesn't look like it's the exact same thing every time. On the Game Boy, there's nothing particularly random but the user. So to give it any sort of, so I couldn't just have the game sit there waiting for somebody to do something and then expect anything random to happen at the same time. It has to start with a non-random thing, wait for the user to do something, in this case, push a start button, then I somehow use the amount of time it took them to push that start button as the initial random value to kick it off. On the Game Boy, there is no time register. You could sit there trying to count, how, you know, having a counter for how many video frames went by, but you know, then your time resolution is only going to be 16 milliseconds, which isn't that great. Because so the same user could f you could find hence to hit start the exact same time, relatively often if you did that. But there is a separate counter that has something to do with DRAM refreshing. If you don't know what DRAM is or what refreshing DRAM is, well, I couldn't really tell you that much other than it's a type of RAM and it needs to be refreshed, and for some reason there's a constantly changing register relating to that. So if you try to read this register without first waiting for the user, then when you get to that line, it's gonna say the same value every time, because it all from startup until it hits your read the code, if you don't have anything dependent on the user in there, it will always take the same amount of time. But if you wait for the user to push a button and then read that register, you'll get a fairly random value. Uh, it's not necessarily a count, but it certainly is changing many, many, many times per millisecond, to my understanding. So this is how I get it so that the ball doesn't start, so you can't like just memorize an identical game every time. Um, and then in this case, I'm really only using one random bit for small variations on how the ball moves. So then it moves on to the final step, which to get it, the thing, Here's a video of what the game looks like. I'm not sure why the sound isn't in the video, um, but there was sound. Uh, and you can see that the collision's pretty buggy, but that's what it looks like that with the scoring, which is just you know collecting, detecting hits here. You know, it doesn't actually, there is nothing to detect hit there, so it gets back to the collision. I have a box that represents where the gate is. Excuse me. Uh, and, you know, a box that, you know, the size and position of the ball and, you know, does the ball box happen to intersect the gate box and I got it wrong. Um, so, um, that takes us to the final code. Um, in theory, I'm a bit worried about what it says is the next slide coming up, so let's see how much, so I'm not sure what that's supposed to be about. Um, I don't know that there's anything I particularly wanted to point at here, uh, but um, you know, it's I think it was something like 200 lines total to do this whole thing. 
uh, not including all of the large arrays exported by those two editor programs I showed. Um, I did create a array of, you know, for the digits zero through nine, what sprite number was that for conveniently being able to turn a integer in memory into a uh, three digit number on the screen. Uh, so I'm using a JavaScript thing called reveal.js for the slides and where you're editing them in a HTML file and I must have gotten some syntax thing that's causing this to show up. I have no idea why this one's here or this one <laughs> or this one or this one. Conclusion. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things not covered here. Did not cover color. Did not color scrolling. I did not color saving data. I did not cover the endless options for bank switching because you can switch banks all over the place for memory, for ROM, for all sorts of stuff. Did not cover mappers. Uh, mappers is how was extra hardware put in the cartridges itself to let you use either more than 32K of ROM or have the 32K of ROM plus the um, plus the uh, you know thing for saving like your pro progress in your game uh, it could also be other things. I don't know that this was ever used in the Game Boy, but certainly in the um, you know uh, hardware extensions inside cartridges was used on other game systems to add like better AI acceleration or 3D acceleration to them. Uh, I don't cover the serial port. I don't cover making sense of sound. I already said that. I don't cover how to debug it. You can get use GDB with this, uh, more if you're using it with an emulator than if you're using it with hardware. I don't cover profiling it. I don't cover unit testing it. If I was to do anything else, uh, my next place to look would be how do I do unit testing with this realistically because I don't want to sit there trying to interactively figure out what's wrong with my collision code. I'd rather just write tests for that. Yes. Um, side to side or up and down. I okay. think that the uh, coordinate system being bigger than the display is for, to facilitate that. So you have, you know, uh, so much t that it can scroll yeah. while you're trying to reload tiled map information, something or other, because it is not fast enough, for, well, you don't, it's not fast enough for you to drive the whole screen, but it's not even fast enough for you to like update all of the tiles or the um, maps for them in a single frame. Actually, going back a bunch of, uh, where would that, uh, for not here. Um, one thing I would like to point out is anywhere that you see well, not const pointers there, but um, the const right here. When you have const data like this in it, that means that the data stays in the ROM. You know, it's not like a disk drive where it has to copy stuff from the disk to memory before you can use it. So when you say const d for data here, that's enabling it to keep that, that's how you d control what sh goes into ROM and what goes into RAM of your program. Um, okay, also not covered. People occasionally did do non-game things with the Game Boy. For instance, somebody made a real sonar fish finder where instead of having a box with a display and the, some minimal controls for displaying where the fish are, it, w they made it cheaper by depending on the Game Boy. <laughs> Anything to talk to the actual sonar stuff then would have to be somehow memory mapped inside a separate chip inside the cartridge. Um, also, uh, things not covered. Somebody made a CNC embroidery machine <laughs> controlled by a Game Boy. That was apparently really popular in Japan, but was also sold some in the US. I've never actually seen one in person. Um, I think its abilities were pretty limited, so it was more for like doing characters and small icon-ish type things, not like doing a really big fancy embroidery pattern. Um, what next? C++ would be cool. 
Um, I'm sure you know anything in the STL is out, but I would imagine that it could make sense to have classes, as in structs with functions, and templates here. Um, I don't know why anyone's not exploring it, but if I wanted to, uh, you know, that would be cool. Lisp on it, that would be interesting. There's lots of Lisps for Z80s out there. I don't know how many of them are made for systems with only 8K of RAM and the needing to fit most of their data into ROM. So it probably would mean that it would have to be pre-compiled, not a light interpretation. I don't know. Uh, that, that would be interesting. But really what's next? I'm probably done with this <laughs> and won't be doing anything next with it. Um, uh, the next thing will probably be something on, you know, some other project that may or may not sound, at least in terms of what next and what I might present, say, next year or the year after, something equally silly, but not Game Boy. And so that's the conclusion. Any questions that I will try to answer but might not be able to, because I am demonstrating how little you need to know to do anything here. <laughs> what? Well, all the source code is on uh, that GitHub repository. I did mean to put a static web page with an emulator on it, but I spent the time working on my slides more, which was probably, for the purposes of tonight, more <laughs> useful. But I will include the link to it in the GitHub if I get back to doing that. Uh, otherwise, it really isn't pr is pretty easy to you know build it yourself and see how terrible it was. So. Are pull requests uh, welcome? Sure. Yeah, so you, but you, you, could, you could go add that emulator. If you, you make a pull request, that might mean that I want to add you, a, result in me trying to add you as a maintainer, <laughs> or even transfer the project to you. <laughs> so pull requests at your own risk. What? Uh, if you can figure out how to work Hello World into a Pac-Man, then, well, that would probably be a start over project anyway, but certainly uh, somebody could do that in probably an afternoon or a day or a weekend or something on that scale. Uh, and it probably would have been some, you know, that I could have done color, but I, as I said, I was feeling like I needed to spend more time on the presentation at, by that point rather than go back and color it. Anything else? Yes. Uh, look after your development machine, because if you have a CPD and the, the binary you generated, you should be able to do it from the Uh Yes. <laughs> um, whoops. Let me just drag this over. And then. Oops. Oops. Uh, sorry. Put the um, window in the wrong. Now I, there we go. Uh. So. Yep. There I am trying to play over my. Sh I mean, playing by two players by myself was bad enough, but doing it over my shoulder does not make it any easier. Well done, sir. So, thank you for asking that, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I said it. Oh, that's interesting. It's, see, I'm, not only did I know it was buggy, but now I'm finding new bugs, like whatever caused it to stop showing that middle digit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure what just happened. I, maybe it crashed. No? Uh. Zach will be uh, accepting sign up for who wants to play and organize this work. Yeah, yeah. We'll get, the, we'll get the round robin going later. Uh, any other questions? Cool. Thank you, Joshua.